Welcome to another Encore presentation of Heart to Heart with Anna. Today's show was featured in Season 1 and was the final show of that season. It features pediatric cardiologist Dr. Jane Newberger and pediatric neurologist Dr. Caitlin Rollins, both of Boston Children's Hospital. It also features heart mom Stephanie Ganaway and special education advocate Lisa O'Connor. There's a great possibility that our babies or children will sustain some kind of brain injury when they're having open heart surgery, especially if they are on a cardiopulmonary bypass machine. This show is one you won't want to miss. Please enjoy today's Encore presentation. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, featuring your host, Anna Jaworski. Our program is a program designed to empower the CHD or congenital heart defect community. Our program may also help families who have children who are chronically ill by bringing information and encouragement to you in order to become an advocate for your community. Now, here is Anna Jaworski. Welcome to the 15th episode of Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Our purpose is to empower members of our community with resources, support, and advocacy information. According to the Livestrong.com website, on causes of infant strokes, the most common serious birth defects are congenital diseases. Congenital heart disease is caused by defects in the membrane surrounding the heart's intraventricular ridge. Patent ductus arteriosus is a heart defect that originates in the ductus arteriosus blood vessel, which is a vital part of blood circulation in infants. According to the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, a normal ductus arteriosus blood vessel closes within minutes or a few days after birth as part of the normal changes in a baby's circulation. When the vessel remains open, it allows oxygen-poor blood from the pulmonary artery to combine with oxygen-rich blood from the aorta, resulting in a severe strain on the heart and an increase in blood pressure. All of these heart problems can affect the flow of blood and oxygen to the brain and cause infant strokes. The blockage of blood flow to the brain is an ischemic stroke. When one of the vessels in the brain bursts, a hemorrhagic stroke occurs. Either of these situations can kill brain cells and have serious or fatal consequences. According to the National Stroke Association, approximately 80% of children who have a stroke endure complications including learning disabilities, seizures, and physical disabilities. Recurring or severe strokes can result in cerebral palsy, epilepsy, mental retardation, one-sided paralysis, and speech and mental impairments. In neurology, the official journal of the American Academy of Neurology, a study was published on July 16, 2013, which stated brain injuries in newborns with congenital heart defects are strongly related to abnormalities of brain microstructural and metabolic brain development especially preoperatively. Both newly acquired preoperative and postoperative brain injuries are related to potentially modifiable clinical risk factors. This is an area a number of hospitals are investigating to determine if they can minimize the risk factors our children born with congenital heart defects might experience. Clearly, brain injury is an area of great importance in children with congenital heart defects. Whether the brain injury or learning disabilities are acquired due to strokes, caused by problems with blood circulation due to their heart defects, or whether children who are born with congenital heart defects have greater potential for brain injuries and possibly even brain development issues is something that I have not heard addressed enough with our population. That's why today's episode, Learning Disabilities and Possible Brain Injury in Children with Congenital Heart Defects, is such an important topic for us to address. Today we have outstanding guests who have various levels of experience with our topic. We have heart mom Stephanie Ganaway, cardiologist Dr. Jay Newberger of Boston Children's Hospital, special education advocate Lisa O'Connor, and pediatric neurologist Dr. Kate Lamarlins of Boston Children's Hospital. Dr. Jane Newberger received her medical degree from Harvard Medical School and her master's in public health from the Harvard School of Public Health. She trained in pediatrics and cardiology at Children's Hospital Boston. She joined the faculty of the Department of Cardiology as instructor in pediatrics and advanced over the next 19 years to professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and associate chief for academic affairs and cardiology at Children's Hospital Boston. Dr. Newberger served on the National Heart Lung Blood Institute Advisory Council and is the senior editor of Circulation. She has made fundamental contributions with major impact on clinical practice in two fields, 
neurological and developmental outcomes with pediatric cardiac surgery and evaluation and therapy of Kawasaki disease. She has received numerous awards and is a prolific author. She maintains an active practice comprised of patients with congenital and acquired heart disease. Stephanie Ganaway is heart mom to son Bodhi, now two, born with a congenital heart defect called Tetralogy of Fallot. He had open heart surgery to repair the defect at six months old. The initial repair was not successful, and he spent 100 days in the pediatric intensive care unit after the initial repair with total systemic failure. His organs shut down. At the end of those 100 days, he survived a catheterization procedure, 16 surgeries, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO, five cardiac arrests, a foot amputation, and an anoxic brain injury from lack of oxygen during cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Recovery from an anoxic brain injury is uncertain. Bodhi's life is about therapies now. He has 12 therapy sessions per week, including hyperbaric oxygen, which is experimental for brain injuries. There is not much information regarding pediatric anoxic injuries related to congenital heart defects, and Stephanie's family have chartered new territory the last two years on the subject. We will meet Issa O'Connor and Dr. Caitlin Rollins later in our show. So thank you, Dr. Newberger and Stephanie Ganaway, for coming on today's show. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, but well, we'll start with Dr. Newberger. Dr. Newberger, you are a major researcher regarding neurological and developmental outcomes following congenital heart defect surgery. Can you tell us how common it is for children with complex congenital heart defects to have brain injury or neurological impairment following open heart surgery? Thank you, Anna. Neurodevelopmental problems are the most common non-cardiac condition that we see in children with congenital heart disease. But it's very important for me to stress at the beginning of this interview that most children with congenital heart disease do very well, in fact. And if you look at adults with congenital heart disease, there are more with bachelor's degrees or higher than who didn't graduate from high school. Now, with respect to the frequency there isn't a simple percent that I can give you, and there are a few reasons for this. The likelihood of having neurodevelopmental challenges depends on a variety of factors, beginning with your genes. So the same genes that cause heart problems can also affect the way the brain is formed. And in fact, the highest likelihood of having neurodevelopmental problems are in those with genetic disorders. In fetal life, so before the baby's even born, the way that blood flow flows to the brain, whether there's an adequate substrate or amount of oxygen and nutrition can affect how the brain forms. And then there are all the factors regarding how sick you are before you go to surgery, what happens in the operating room, and then again, how sick you are after surgery. And I should stress that home environment is still really an important factor. The second issue is how complicated is your heart disease? So it's been estimated that as many as half of children who have the most complicated forms of congenital heart disease, like single ventricle, may have neurodevelopmental challenges. But for simple heart problems like atrial septal defect without any genetic syndrome, development is really very similar to that in the normal population. And then finally, there are different types of neurodevelopmental abilities. Most people think of IQ or intelligence quotient, but that's probably the least affected in congenital heart disease patients. So other domains include your language skills, your visual perceptual spatial ability, your ability to pay attention, fine and gross motor skills, and then executive function. An executive function is your ability to prioritize and do multi-step tasks to apply principles to solve problems. We know, for example, that executive function is a huge problem and it becomes much more evident as you go further in school and particularly in high school. And I think that's why we see a lot of times that our heart children are able to catch up to their peers by the time they enter kindergarten. But then later on, when they're in high school, all of a sudden they start exhibiting more problems. Would that explain it? Right. That is definitely true. Well, many times our babies are born with complex congenital heart defects, and they have surgery within the first few days of life. And once again, those are the children with the more complex congenital heart defects. I imagine that our smallest survivors suffer 
some kind of brain injury. Can you tell us about the brain's ability to learn, perhaps with the assistance of therapy, despite strokes or anoxic episodes which might cause brain damage? Sure. So first of all, although over the past two decades, there has been a huge amount of focus on the operation itself and the techniques that are used to support or supply blood flow to the body and the brain during surgery, we now know that surgery itself contributes relatively little. We know that being very anemic during surgery or being on the heart-lung machine a very long time can be associated with worse outcomes. In terms of the types of problems that can happen before surgery, during surgery, and after surgery, recent, you know, it used to be that people focused more on strokes, but those are relatively uncommon. We're understanding much better now that injury to the white matter of the brain, the the kind of part of the brain cell that connects one part of the brain to the other can get very disrupted if you're sick as a newborn before you go to surgery, sometimes as a result of, of factors during surgery, and then especially if you have a great deal of difficulty, if you're very, very sick with low blood pressure, heart or cardiac arrest, or other problems after surgery. You asked about therapy and how the brain can heal itself. And you have Caitlin Rollins on the phone who is really an expert, but I would say that the brain is what we call plastic, meaning that if you disrupt certain pathways, other pathways can be formed so that children can solve problems, sometimes in a slightly different way. And Early interventions of various types and therapies can improve outcomes a lot. Yeah, I think that's an excellent answer. Absolutely. And from personal experience, my son did suffer a stroke with one of his surgeries. And since I have a bachelor's in speech pathology and worked on my master's, I was able to identify where the stroke probably happened. And since he was only nine months old, by the time he was five, nobody would have known that he had a stroke. He was able to regain the ability to speak, and his receptive language was never disturbed, but his expressive language was. So I think the brain's ability to compensate when there are problems is really quite amazing. It is amazing. That is true. Well, Dr. Neuberger, as a cardiologist who has specialized in neurological development of children with congenital heart defects, what is the most important advice you can offer parents of congenital heart defect survivors who have suffered some kind of brain injury, either before or during or after surgery? So I think I'm going to start by saying I think focusing on brain injury around the time of surgery is probably not the perfect focus here. We feel that all children, because of the other factors like genetic issues and fetal circulation, we feel that all children with high-risk congenital heart disease should be followed and they should be screened. There should be surveillance in the pediatric office and those in the highest risk group actually need specific screening testing at particular periods of time. So those high-risk children are those who were newborns or infants who needed open-heart surgery. Children who have cyanotic heart disease who are very blue, even if they didn't get open-heart surgery. Children with heart disease and certain what we call comorbidities or other medical risk factors like being a preemie, having a genetic syndrome, having been on ECMO or extracorporeal membrane support, having a heart transplant, having had to have resuscitation after a heart arrest, being in the hospital for more than two weeks, or having seizures. Those are all examples of children who actually need formal screening. And screening can be done at any time that you perceive problems, but is specifically recommended whether or not you had recognized brain injury at surgery is specifically recommended for high-risk children now between 12 and 24 months of age, 3 to 5 years of age, and 11 to 12 years of age, or any other time the problems are noted. Wow. Well, that's really good to know that the doctors are aware that the screening can help to catch any problems that may occur early. Thank you so much, Dr. Neuberger. You're welcome. So now we'll turn our attention to Stephanie Anaway. Stephanie, when I read Bodhi's story, I truly felt like I was reading about a living, breathing miracle. You say he's in 12 therapy sessions per week. Can you tell us a little bit about the kinds of therapy he receives? Sure, Anna. For the most part, he's involved in traditional therapies, physical therapy, occupational therapy, 
speech and feeding therapy. He does have a couple of additional therapies that are a little less common, aquatic therapy, which is therapy in a swimming pool, and hippotherapy, which is therapeutic horseback riding on a dynamic surface that will help a kid like him with an anoxic brain injury hopefully recognize how it feels to walk so that his brain can make that connection and maybe as his skills develop, he can learn to to walk, which he cannot do at this moment. He also has vision therapy. He does have a cortical visual impairment related to the cardiac arrest where he sustained his anoxic brain injury. And the last therapy that he does, which, as you mentioned, is experimental for brain injuries, is hyperbaric oxygen treatment. Wow. <laughs> you must be busy every single day taking him to different therapies and then doing the homework that you have to do. Oh, yes. <laughs> and then we need to carry over what he learns in therapy at home mm -hmm. in order for it to be effective. So he keeps us busy. Yeah, I would say so. So what are the most important objectives that you're working on with Bodhi right now? Well, I would say that less so behavioral objectives. Bodhi's behavior is appropriate given his age and the extent of his brain injury. He did have an anoxic brain injury, which means his brain atrophied and fluid built up in the space where his injured brain, uh, after his injured brain atrophied, and he did have hydrocephalus that needed to be resolved and had seizures for a period of time while there was the hydrocephalus or fluid under pressure. He had a number of brain surgeries. The, the number of surgeries that we mentioned earlier, the majority of those surgeries were some type of brain procedure, surgery, or procedure to resolve the hydrocephalus, which he no longer has. And he had a subdural shunt placed and has since been removed. He had a trach and a G-tube also, which is a tracheostomy in his throat to help him breathe, and a G-tube to help him eat. Both of those have also been removed. Wow, so he's and really so, made a lot of progress. Yes, he's made quite a bit of progress in that area, considering an anoxic brain injury after heart surgery is really not that common. If someone that went through all the complications that Bodhi went through, which I can only describe as a medical pileup, uh, <laughs> it's like a stack of dominoes fell over. Things typically don't go this way for kids with Tetralogy of Fallot. Tetralogy of Fallot is one of the more common complex heart diseases, congenital heart defects, and Typically, the initial heart surgery is, is a success, and they do very well, as Dr. Neuberger said. But that wasn't the case with Bodhi for whatever reason, and that just didn't happen for him. So um, now all we can do for Bodhi is concentrate on therapies and give him every opportunity to make some type of recovery from his anoxic brain injury, which, again, is not common. Of course, he, you know, children that have congenital heart defects and have their open heart surgery and spend a lot of time in the hospital and have the sedation or, and are on equipment and are intubated and, and are in the hospital for a long time. I definitely agree with Dr. Neuberger that those children are more prone to experience some type of developmental delay or even developmental defects that, of course, with an anoxic brain injury, Bodhi definitely has delays. And, and uh, we don't know what his recovery will be because the brain is very interesting and mysterious. But with this level of injury, we don't know what type of recovery. And there's, there's really no way to know. Well, I think you're giving him every opportunity to have the best recovery he possibly could. I'm stunned at all the different kinds of therapy, including hippotherapy, which I have a friend who works with horses. And I think that's a very unusual but very effective type of therapy. So, Stephanie, we, we're a little bit over time already, so if you could just tell us briefly what piece of advice you would offer parents whose children have had the same kind of difficult hospital stay Bodhi has had. I, well, my, be? my best advice would be just to find support. When you're going through crisis mode, you kind of just have to get through minute, minute by minute, hour by hour, day to day, and you need either family or friends as a support group. And especially as you move beyond crisis mode and reality sets in that your life may be different with your differently abled child. So that's my best advice is there's good online resources, family or friends, find some support, and don't try to do it alone. I think that's excellent advice. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and, and thank Dr. you. 
Kirk, you both were wonderful. I really appreciate you sharing your experiences and advice with us. Now it's time for a commercial break, but don't leave yet. Coming up, we have a special education advocate who will share with us how she helps families of children with special needs. Find out what kind of tools she can use to help children achieve success when we return with Heart to Heart with Anna. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect, or CHD, community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Anna Jaworski has spoken around the world at congenital heart defect events, and she is available as a keynote or guest speaker for your event. Go to hearttoheartwithanna.com to learn more about booking Anna for your event. You can also find out more about the radio program. Keep up to date with CHD resources and information about advocacy groups, as well as read Anna's weekly blog. Anna wants you to stay well-connected and participate in the CHD community. Visit hearttoheartwithanna.com today. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at Heart to Heart with Anna dot com. That's Anna at Heart to Heart with Anna dot com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today, we are talking with heart mom, Stephanie Ganaway, cardiologist, Dr. Jane Newberger at Boston Children's Hospital, special education advocate, Lisa O'Connor, and pediatric neurologist, Dr. Caitlin Rollins. We just finished talking with heart mom, Stephanie Ganaway, and cardiologist, Dr. Jane Newberger, who shared some valuable information about the kinds of brain injuries that children with complex congenital heart defects can suffer from, and how one little boy has survived despite the odds against him. Now we will turn our attention to Lisa O'Connor. Lisa O'Connor is a special education advocate representing children and their parents as they navigate through special education. She lives in the greater Boston area and received her training through the Federation for Children with Special Needs. She is also a court-appointed special education surrogate parent representing children in state custody overseeing their education. Through her experience, she has met many families of children with heart defects seeking guidance due to developmental delays, learning disabilities, and the need for accommodations. She has found rewarding pathways that enable children to fully access the school environment. She is well-versed in special education law, individualized education plans, accommodations, and individualized care plans, health care plans, all of which students are entitled to. Through her advocacy, she aims to share her knowledge and experience with the heart community. She can be found on Facebook at Special Education Collaborative Consulting. And we'll meet Dr. Caitlin Rollins in our next segment. Thank you, Lisa, for coming on Heart to Heart with Anna. Thank you, Anna. Welcome to be here. Well, you have been such a very strong advocate for many children with special needs who have had open-heart surgery. Can you briefly tell us what services are available for a baby born with a congenital heart defect who may be experiencing developmental delays and who a parent should contact if they're concerned about their baby's development? Okay, Anna. Sometimes it is difficult for a parent to know if their child has a developmental delay, and this is especially true if they're a first-time parent or if their child has significant medical concerns. Many infants with heart defects need to undergo major surgeries and therefore end up with substantial hospital stays, and parents become so involved with their baby's more major medical concerns that developmental milestones don't seem to be as important at the time. And babies are seen by their pediatricians for their well-baby checkups, and this is typically when pediatricians will ask parents if the children are meeting the developmental milestones. And this is also a great time for parents to discuss any concerns that they have if they've noticed that their baby is not doing something that they think they should be doing. Some mm-hmm. parents are fortunate, and they might have older children, so they know what to expect. Well, first-time parents do not. 
First-time parents, like the parents of a heart baby, are unsure what is normal or what to expect, especially after surgeries. The bottom line is that parents need to go with their intuition if something does not seem right to them, and some babies born with congenital heart defects may not want to do such things as tummy time or rolling over, sitting, crawling, standing, walking, and eventually talking. Parents can always consult with their pediatrician as well as their cardiologist or their local early childhood intervention programs and request for an evaluation to be done. Babies mm-hmm. and toddlers can receive services for such things as feeding, speech services, occupational therapy, physical therapy that will address fine motor and gross motor delays, and there are very many different kinds of services that can be offered to the younger child. Excellent. That's excellent information. And I like the fact that you talked about the difference between first-time parents and parents who have other children, because you're right. A lot of times with the first-time parents, they're just learning how to be a parent. So they don't even know about some of those developmental milestones. Or like you said, it really doesn't matter as much right now. What they're focused on is their baby's survival. Absolutely. Well, early childhood intervention is of critical importance, especially if we want our children to lead quality lives. However, assistance for children with learning disabilities or brain injuries doesn't stop when a child graduates from the early childhood program. So can you briefly explain what services might be available to parents of toddlers before they enter kindergarten? Okay. Well, early intervention programs typically run from birth until the child reaches three years of age. However, after age three, your child may still require some sort of support. And if this is the case, early intervention, if you're involved in that program, will refer the family to a local public school for continuation of services. A transition meeting would be scheduled between the early intervention program, the parents, and the child. And they would probably have the school do an evaluation of the child before they enter to find out the most appropriate way to support the child's needs. And while the academic demands have not yet come into the picture yet, the child would still require support for speech, occupational therapy, physical therapy, perhaps vision, emotional, or sensory issues. And a team of special education service providers would be put together at that point to help the child. There are so many different things that can go wrong that if we take care of those problems early, then our children can start with their peers or maybe just a little bit older than what their peers are. So that's why that early intervention is just so critically important. Well, let's move on to when our children are actually in elementary school and all of a sudden they start having more demands on them, including taking part in physical education and maybe even moving from one place to another for different classes. Sometimes our heart children have difficulty keeping up with all of these demands. What kind of provisions can be made for children who are having trouble keeping up with their peers when they're in the elementary school years? And how can a parent be an advocate for these elementary school age children? That's a great question, Anna. Of course, when children are in the elementary school and they require services, the children would either be put on an individual educational plan or a 504. An individual education plan has goals and accommodations, while a 504 plan is essentially just accommodations. When it comes to physical education, that also comes into play as the child gets older because that's a typically a required curriculum in the schools. The physical education piece can also be part of the individual education plan or a 504. Another important document that parents should have put into place at their schools is an individual health care plan or an emergency action plan. And these particular documents would cover any medical concerns that the school needs to know about. And it's crucial that these plans are shared with everyone who comes in contact with the student. And it lets the school personnel that the child has medical issues and what to do in case of an emergency. And yeah. these health care plans should be shared with everybody, teachers, nurses, aides, administrators, you know, speech, occupational, physical therapists, vision therapists, school psychologists, guidance, as well as the special teachers that are typically are librarians, art music, phys ed teachers as well as recess aides, after-school providers, and bus drivers. And you don't want these confidential documents to be hung on classroom walls, but they should be kept in confidential folders so substitute teachers will also have access to them. And it's imperative that an updated photo of your child is included with these plans for identification purposes. That's an excellent point. I know that I've had a lot of friends whose children, by the time they're in school, are doing much better, and they don't want for their children to be treated differently. So a lot of times they don't give the people at the schools 
this kind of information. But I agree with you. I think it's of critical importance, and not just for the teacher, but also the principal and all the other teachers they may come in contact with, the librarian. Like you said, this is something that's of critical importance if we're going to be good advocates for our children. Right. And as well, too, with phys ed class, you know, not all of the hot children are able to fully participate in the phys ed programs, and some Mm -hmm. of them might not be allowed to play contact sports, so some of them may have to wear chest protectors. And every child's unique, so the school plans are unique to meet the child's needs as well. And typically schools are very willing to work with families to come up with plans that will meet the child's needs while not making the child feel any different from their peers. And I have found that communication between the school and parents is key to helping the child be successful. I think so, too. Now, you talk about being an advocate. Do all schools have special education advocates like you who can help the parents navigate the different things that they have to do, like going to an ARD meeting or meeting with the different people? Does every school district have someone like you to help? School districts don't typically have special education advocates. We usually work independently, and parents contact us to help them maneuver through the special education area because in the very beginning when parents are new to special education, there's a lot of information and it's always helpful to have an advocate help guide you Mm -hmm. so that the child eventually has the greatest success. I agree. Can you tell our listeners again how they could contact you or a professional like you? You can typically go online and Google special education advocate Or you can always contact, most states have departments of education, and within Mm -hmm. the departments of education, there's usually special education departments as well, and there's other facilities that you can contact. I know in the Boston area, there's the Federation for Children with Special Needs, and there's other places, too, that you can contact to find advocates if you need assistance and guidance. I think a lot of times people don't even know where to turn, Lisa. I agree. I totally agree. But I think once parents do find a need for assistance, advocates are always there to help. They can go to meetings if you want them to. They can review evaluations, IEP documents, or they can just be there to just give parents ideas, perhaps phys ed accommodations or whatever a parent's need is. Typically, an advocate is a great avenue to check out to see what's available. Thank you so much, Lisa, for sharing your advice and for helping our children with congenital heart defects who also have learning disabilities or brain injuries. Well, thank you very much, Anna. It was a joy to be able to share with families that need assistance. Well, now it's time for a commercial break, but don't go far. Stay tuned to find out what a pediatric neurologist is and how that professional can help children who suffer from brain injuries or learning disabilities when we return to Heart to Heart with Anna. Anna Jaworski has spoken around the world at congenital heart defect events, and she is available as a keynote or guest speaker for your event. Go to hearttoheartwithanna.com to learn more about booking Anna for your event. You can also find out more about the radio program. Keep up to date with CHD resources and information about advocacy groups, as well as read Anna's weekly blog. Anna wants you to stay well-connected and participate in the CHD community. Visit hearttoheartwithanna.com today. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect or CHD community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. 
Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today we are talking with heart mom, Stephanie Ganaway, cardiologist, Dr. Jane Newberger of Boston Children's Hospital, special education advocate, Lisa O'Connor, and pediatric neurologist, Dr. Caitlin Rollins. We just finished talking with Lisa O'Connor about her experience as a special education advocate, and earlier we spoke with heart mom, Stephanie Ganaway, and Dr. Jane Newberger. Now we will meet Dr. Caitlin Rollins. Caitlin Rollins, MD, is a fellow in behavioral neurology at Boston Children's Hospital. She attended college at Harvard University and medical school at the University of Pennsylvania. She remained at Pennsylvania for pediatrics residency, then moved to Boston Children's Hospital for pediatric neurology training. She is a member of the Cardiac Neurodevelopmental Program, where she sees children with congenital heart defects, or CHDs, for neurological follow-up focusing on issues like motor impairment, developmental delay, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and learning disabilities. Her research focuses on elucidating the biological basis of neurodevelopmental impairments in CHD survivors. Her research has evaluated the relationship between brain MRI findings and neuropsychological performance in adolescents with CHDs. Currently, she is focused on understanding the influence of prenatal factors on brain development in CHDs. She hopes someday to minimize the neurological sequelae of being born with a congenital heart defect. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Dr. Rollins. Thank you so much for having me. Well, this is a delight to have both you and Dr. Newberger on one show. I just very, very blessed today. <laughs> Thank you. First of all, can you please tell us what a pediatric neurologist is? and how a pediatric neurologist can help parents of children born with complex congenital heart defects. Sure. So in general, for most children that have complex congenital heart defects, their neurodevelopmental care is going to be provided by a whole team of specialists, and the neurologist is just one part of that team. The team will vary somewhat for each child depending upon what their needs are and also what the local resources are that are available. So the pediatric neurologist, what their role will be on the team, is to really try to understand any sorts of specific injuries that might have occurred in the brain, so things like stroke, like you mentioned earlier, or hypoxia, like what Bodhi had experienced. They can also treat issues like seizures or epilepsy, and neurodevelopmental issues like developmental delays or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. The team will also include other people such as developmental psychologists or neuropsychologists who can perform specific testing. They'll describe the development of the child and also the cognitive strengths and weaknesses. The team includes early intervention providers and feeding specialists as well as advocates like you've had on, on our show already. Mm -hmm. One thing that I think that's really important for the neurologist on the team to do is really to communicate with the family and the rest of the team members about how the child's specific heart condition can affect the brain. So I like to look at the child's medical history and look at those risk factors that Dr. Newberger mentioned to see how high risk are they for having future neurodevelopmental concerns. If they do have a known injury, then we would discuss with the family what are the symptoms that we would expect from that and what is the prognosis likely to be. Sometimes we order tests like MRIs and sometimes we prescribe medications if they're appropriate, for example, for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So not every child necessarily needs a pediatric neurologist, but what you really need is just to make sure there's someone on the child's overall team who's experienced in these areas and can serve that role. That's really interesting. My son is 19, he'll be 20 this year, and I don't remember ever meeting a pediatric neurologist. That's, it's amazing because I was thinking about that as you were talking about that. You said he had had a stroke. So oftentimes nowadays you would meet a pediatric neurologist on the team, but they're certainly not available everywhere. Right. We didn't know. The reason why I knew that he had a stroke, of course, was because of my educational background. But he had partially paralyzed diaphragm and completely paralyzed vocal cords after the second surgery. So it wasn't until he started to recover from that that I recognized that he had stroke characteristics. Dr. Rollins, can you please tell us about the different kinds of tests you just alluded to that are being tests? So what kinds of tests would be used on an infant to determine if the baby had had brain injury either before or during the surgery? And who would conduct those tests? That's a great question. So the first 
type of test that I would perform isn't even necessarily what many people would consider a test, but it's probably the most important test to me, and that's the neurological examination. So what I do for all of the infants that I see is I look at the child's interaction. What is their eye contact like? How do they respond to me and vocalize, respond to their parents? Very important is the neuromotor exam. So looking at their muscle tone, their muscle strength and reflexes. We're looking to make sure there's no asymmetries or increased or decreased tone is often the case. We also check their vision and their hearing because those could be affected by heart disease. So that's the most basic test, which really kind of lays the groundwork for understanding how are all of the different parts of the brain functioning and are there areas that might not be functioning the way we would expect. Then once we have a good understanding of that, we can decide if a child even needs further testing. So certainly not every child who has heart surgery needs testing beyond that. If there's abnormal findings on the exam or if the child's medical course is very complicated, so for example, if they had a long course of ECMO or multiple cardiac arrests, then the medical team or neurologist might request additional testing. Mm -hmm. And the most common things would be neuroimaging, like a brain MRI or an ultrasound. The brain MRI is a really great picture, a lot of detail to look at the structure of the brain. So the exam looked at function, the MRI can look at the structure of the brain and the underlying anatomy. And we can make sure on the MRI that there's no abnormalities in the way that the brain has formed. So like Dr. Neuberger mentioned, sometimes there can be genetic conditions or associated factors with the heart forming abnormally that can also cause the brain to form abnormally. So we can look at that. We can look for hypoxic injury or strokes. The advantage of an MRI is that it's a great picture of the brain, but the disadvantage is that it can take a really long time to do, and children have to be stable to be able to go down to the MRI scanner, remain still, and it lasts about an hour. So oftentimes in the acute setting where an infant might be on ECMO or be very sick in the ICU, they would get an ultrasound of the head instead, which can just get a very quick picture to look for any major bleeds or major abnormalities in the way the brain is formed. So depending upon the setting, different tests might be ordered, and sometimes you get the ultrasound early on, and then later down the road, a child might get a brain MRI, or many children may never need any of these tests, which obviously would be the simplest thing. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, Alex actually got a brain MRI at your hospital. That's how I met Dr. Neuberger because he took part in a study they were conducting looking at the brains of adolescents who had had the Fontan procedure. I'm dying to see what all of the research that you all have done, what kind of information you can tell all of us because many of us have questions about this. We know that the brain goes through a tremendous amount of changes in the first five years of life, but then again it does in the teenage years as well. So can you tell us some common behaviors that children may exhibit that would alert parents to seek additional help for their older children if they're having problems in school? I think that's a really great question, and I was really happy. I heard earlier a lot of your guests brought up something that I wanted to bring up as well, which is just that children oftentimes do very, very well early on, but as you get older, the demands of school and daily life can change. So we really want to make sure we're keeping a close eye on this as they get older and monitoring regularly. So I have kind of a list of questions that I have recommend for cardiologists and also for parents just to ask themselves, and some are very basic, and they can just cue you into learning disabilities or attention problems. So do you feel like your child is struggling in school? Check in with the teacher, did they have concerns? Is your child resisting attending school or do they have a lot of absences and they might not be explained just by going to doctor's visits? Does it take them a much longer time to complete their homework than you would expect? That can be a sign that there's something that's standing in the way of them getting through it efficiently. What's their attention and activity level like? So are they seeming like they're not listening to you, making careless mistakes, easily distracted. I look at their level of organization in the home, so asking how long does it take to get ready in the morning. If it takes a whole lot of prompting and a much longer time than you would expect to get ready, then it may be that those same organizational troubles are affecting their schoolwork and their daily life, and that can be very difficult at home and also at school. And finally, you really want to consider your child's mental health. Think about if they might seem sad or anxious. They may have a lot of somatic complaints like stomach aches or headaches, and how they're getting along with peers. Are they being bullied? The American Heart Association released a statement in 2012, and that's where those risk factors that we were talking about came from. And they actually recommend that in some kids who do have those high risk factors, they just be evaluated, as Dr. Neuberger mentioned, intermittently as they get older, even if they don't have any symptoms, because you just want to make sure that you're really being thorough and identifying things early. 
Oh, I love that. I love that. I think that's one of the things that helps the parents to feel like they're more in control, too. Because here's the thing. When you're raising children, especially when you're raising a special child, you worry that maybe you're doing something to contribute to behavioral problems. Or maybe you're enabling them to not do the best they could do. And by having these frequent checkups, then that eliminates that as being a problem. Instead, what we're really doing is looking at what the possible cause of the problem is, and hopefully it's not as parents. <laughs> exactly. I think there's so many people that they've never been told that it's associated with heart disease, and once they find out, it's really empowering and, and liberating to know that it's something that's medically related. Right, and that there are things that can be done. I think Absolutely. That's- is to know that, wait a minute, my kid's not a brat. My kid's not lazy. My kid has a brain injury. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Well, that doesn't sound great. (laughs) You know, it's not something that you want to hear. At least it's an explanation. Exactly. Hey, we can go to therapy or we can try this. So they're going to need this 504 plan and then they can be as successful as their peers. My goodness. Thank you so much, Dr. Rollins. I wish I could have a whole hour with you. There's so much that we parents need to learn. And us old timers, we didn't get this kind of information. (laughs) I feel like I'm on a huge, steep learning curve. But thank you so much for helping us to understand the role of a pediatric neurologist as part of the Heart Child's care team and how parents can be advocates for their children. And thank you for encouraging us to also trust ourselves. And ask those questions. I I really appreciate that. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. It's time for another commercial break, but don't leave yet. It's almost time for our miracle moment. And today's miracle moment will be excerpts from an essay in the heart of a father that is entitled One of God's Special Children by Stephen Slobodnik. Find out how Stephen has handled having a daughter with special needs and what those special needs were when we return to Heart to Heart with Anna. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect, or CHD, community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Anna Jaworski has spoken around the world at congenital heart defect events, and she is available as a keynote or guest speaker for your event. Go to hearttoheartwithanna.com to learn more about booking Anna for your event. You can also find out more about the radio program. Keep up to date with CHD resources and information about advocacy groups, as well as read Anna's weekly blog. Anna wants you to stay well-connected and participate in the CHD community. Visit hearttoheartwithanna.com today. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at heart to heart with Anna.com. That's Anna at heart to heart with Anna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. I'd like to take another moment to thank our guests today, Drs. Jane Neuberger and Caitlin Rollins from Boston Children's Hospital, Heart Mom Stephanie Ganaway, and Special Education Advocate Lisa O'Connor. We have addressed so many important issues that affect our congenital heart defect community today, and I really appreciate all four of these wonderful women taking the time to speak with me and to help empower our community. Now it's time for our miracle moment. Our miracle moment today comes from the heart of a father and is by Stephen Slobodnik. I will be reading selected excerpts from his essay called One of God's Special Children. If you'd like to read Stephen's essay in its entirety, please turn to page 107 in The Heart of a Father. Stephen writes, My wife and I began parenthood after 40. Judy became pregnant in December and because of her age had five ultrasounds and an amniocentesis done. Nothing was ever detected out of the normal range. Laura was born a healthy baby with high APGAR scores. About 30 hours after birth, the nurse detected a heart murmur. Our daughter was placed in an intermediate nursery. 
Judy was not allowed to see Laura since she developed an infection from her C-section. It was a stressful time. There were eight children in each area, and all of the monitors seemed to be going off. We also could not get any answers regarding our daughter's treatment. Tuesday arrived with still no word on what ailed Laura's heart, so I called the cardiologist's office and demanded to know what was going on. The doctor was clinical and unemotional during her explanation of Laura's heart condition. Laura suffered from hypoplastic left heart syndrome and a coarctation of the aorta. On September 18th, Laura had surgery, which lasted nine hours. The surgeon reported shortly after the operation that everything went well. He repaired her aorta and placed a band on her pulmonary artery. About one hour after surgery, Laura went into cardiac arrest. It was a fight to save her life. On Friday, September 20th, my wife called me at work to tell me to come to the hospital 50 miles away right after work. When I got there, the surgeon and cardiologist were waiting to talk to us. The surgeon said things were looking bad. Laura's blood pressure kept dropping, and they did not know why. He did not think she would get through the weekend. After they left the room, Judy and I prayed for Laura. Then we went to see her. We called the hospital Catholic chaplain to meet us in the pediatric intensive care unit. He arrived, and we prayed over Laura. I will always remember this moment because the surgeon was with us and left the room in tears. About an hour later, Laura had seizures, which the medical staff believed were the source of her complications. With these under control, Laura's chance to survive the weekend improved to 50%. She spent a total of 60 days in the hospital. Laura stayed well until late January of 1997. Then she developed hydrocephalus. This is an accumulation of fluid in the cavities inside the brain. Our pediatrician immediately sent us to the University of Iowa Hospital to meet with a neurosurgeon. Laura was given a CAT scan. When we met with the surgeon, he explained that Laura needed surgery. They would place a shunt into the ventricular system of the brain. A catheter would then be connected to the shunt and divert the excess fluid to her abdomen. She went into surgery that afternoon. It lasted about two hours. Laura did well and spent five days in the hospital. The hemifontan went well. Being Laura's second surgery, we knew the ICU routine. Our pediatrician, two months after surgery, sent us to a clinic that works with kids with special medical problems. They planned a two-day exam in January 1998. We saw a team including physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech pathology, nutrition, a dentist, a pediatrician, and a social worker. After the exam, the social worker told us what programs and assistance were available to Laura. The social worker did all the paperwork for us to qualify for Medicaid and the ill and handicapped waiver and arranged for Laura to start early childhood education. We also got a 15-page report on Laura's physical and mental capabilities. We realized the best way to help our daughter was to learn as much as we could about her medical condition and the treatments available to her. As you can see, Stephen and his wife Judy did much of what we talked about in today's show. Some people who are not heart parents may wonder why I chose this essay as a miracle moment. It is truly a miracle that Laura survived all of the surgeries she has had to have, both heart surgeries and brain surgeries. The fact that her parents love and accept her for who she is is also a beautiful testament to a parent's unconditional love. To me, that qualifies for a miracle moment. To read more about Stephen's experience, please check out The Heart of a Father, available at www.babyheartspress.com, amazon.com, or kidswithheart.org. Thank you for listening today. Please come back next week on Tuesday at noon Eastern Time for a brand new episode. During the month of February, also known as Heart Month, Heart to Heart with Anna will broadcast a show every day. On Tuesdays, we'll have a brand new show featuring our theme for Season 7, Congenital Heart Defects Around the Globe. The other days will be encore presentations with a brand new intro. If you'd like to know what shows will be featured, you can check out our website at www.hearttoheartwithanna.com. Please find and like us on Facebook. Check out our Café Press Boutique. Revenue from the Café Press Boutique helps to defray the cost of this radio show. Follow our radio show on Blog Talk Radio and especially on Spreaker. Once we get to 100 followers on Spreaker, we can petition iHeartRadio to carry our show, and then people can listen to Heart to Heart with Anna in their cars. Thanks again for listening. We know that congenital heart defects touch people all over the globe. So remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you've been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna 
with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time. We'll talk again next week. 